We're on the air. We're on the air. Okay. Hi, Tor. Anytime, people. We're back after my vacation in Chicago and in Los Angeles, or Los Angeles and Chicago. All right. We have uh, Parshas uh, Kisisa. We have there are a couple of points that have to be done here properly and responsibly, and then uh, tomorrow we'll go on to uh, hopefully Parshas Vayakel. Um, the first, the first obviously is the is the uh, the Egel, the golden calf. If you turn to page uh, <coughs> Perik Lamed Beis Pasuk Aleph, which is on page Lamed Beis four ninety two, right at the bottom. Okay. So Moshe Rabbeinu goes up to the mountain. He says to the people, "I'm going to be back in forty days." Now this is a man who has been. Uh, precise to the split second and everything that's happened up until this point. He's been precise to the split second. And when Moshe Rabbeinu says to you that he's coming back at a certain point, like the plague of the firstborn is going to be at the crack, at, right at midnight and so on and so forth, and Moshe Rabbeinu goes up to a mountain with no food and no provision, says I can be back in 40 days and he's late. And you're out in the desert all by yourself with no leader, with nobody. So then you, get, you can understand that the people might be a little too hitched. You understand? And if you put it, you always have to put it in the proper perspective. You understand that the people, it's not just a bunch of people who are, you know, a bunch of high school kids in American public school are looking to make trouble. You know, you're, you're, you're talking about a situation where Moshe Rabbeinu is like, hey, he said he'd be back and he's not back. Now, what are we going to do? And that's why the Torah says, <laughs> They saw that Moshe Rabbeinu was delayed by six hours, according to their calculation. They said, Make a God for us. We don't know what happened to Moshe. So the first thing is that clearly they were not looking for, they're looking for a replacement for Moshe Rabbeinu. It's clearly, they said, we don't know what happened to Moshe. Make something for, make something, we don't know where Moshe is. Now make something else that's going to guide us. They weren't idiots, and they knew that the golden calf that they threw into the fire isn't what brought them out of Egypt. But they're looking for this intermediary between them and God, which Moshe Rabbeinu has been serving as. But an intermediary made out of an idol is idol worship, even if you're using it to get to God. That's what idol worship began. That's how the Rambam describes the original generation of Enosh, when they worshipped idols, it was using an intermediary of stone, of, uh, uh, of, of an inanimate object to get to God, which is idol worship and is liable for, it's a capital offense. So they said to Moshe Rabbeinu, we want an intermediary. So what does Aaron do? Get the gold uh, earrings from your wives, your sons, and your daughter. So, uh, <coughs> you know, there's always a strategy. Aaron says, go get the gold earrings from your wives. Because women are much more attuned to these. So when men get these, these ideas, women are attuned. That, that's going to be a del- What do you want my earrings for? Oh, we're just, uh, we got uh, some sort of religious thing. Yeah, what religious thing? Well, you know, our own, our own, our own coin. Yeah, what did our own say? Well, our own said that to bring the gold rings to make the, whose idea was this? You know, there, there's going to be, res- women are always going to be more resistant. They have a sense for what's right and wrong. The men are all, they're all in. The women are, maybe that'll hold them back. So they bring the gold to Aaron, and he goes and he makes this calf, which has to do with a symbol of serving God. An ox is the ultimate, and the ultimate uh, servant. The steady servant you have on your, on your farm is the ox. He's the most steady, he works every day. It's a symbol of how they're going to serve God at a deeper level. And then, Vahimi Machras, Aaron goes and they make this golden calf. Then look at Pasuk Zvav. Four lines on the bottom of 492. Vayashkimu Mi Machras, they get up early the next morning. Vayalu Olos, Vayagishu Shlomim, they bring offering, burnt offerings, and Shlomim are peace offerings. They sit down to eat and drink. And if you look at Rashi, Rashi says, They get up to 
to, to, to re- how does the Eretz go to revel? What's the word to revel? Right? Litzachek. Like a frat party. Right? So Aaron says, and you know what goes on at frat parties. All they do is discuss philosophy. Right? Right? So Aaron says, uh, it's a left column, it's eight lines from the bottom. Litzachek. Says Rashi, if you find a please show the birthday, yesh b'mash mahazek gilu yaroyos. Immorality. Kimoshinemar litzachek bi, which Mrs. Potiphar said. Vishvichus damim and blood spilling. It's also implied. Afka nerag chur. Chur was killed over here. So, one of the commentaries points out this. It's so profound. This comment is so profound. What do you see over here? They brought sacrifices, then they ate and they drank, and they, they got in the, involved in morality. So, Rabbi Mendel Weinbach, that's all, the Rosh Hashiva of Orsamech. So, he was, at one point, he was uh, doing what's called, uh, 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 they call it Miluim in Israel. Uh, he was in the army. He had to do his, uh, each year he had to go back for a month to do his civil service. What, I forgot what they call it in English. Reserves. The reserves, the reserves. So, always take spoons out of coffee, gentlemen. That could have been caught on camera. Oh, maybe it was. The, uh, the, uh, no, sh- nobody tell my wife. The, uh, I won't tell if you don't. The, uh, uh, the, 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 um, he was in the reserves. So he was in the army, and he went to his base. If you do Rav Weinbach, Rav Weinbach was always learning. If he wasn't doing something else, he was learning. So he's in his tent at night, and one of the secular guys says, Weinbach, why don't you come with us? We're having a party. Nothing to do on the base, so they're having, we're having a party. So he goes, no, thank you very much. The guy said to him, why not? Why don't you want to go to a party? So he said to him, because parties very quickly descend to the lowest common denominator. That's what happens at parties. So this guy goes traipsing off, and he comes back 45 minutes later. Rav Weinbach said to him, oh, why are you back so soon? He said, you were right. It quickly descended to the lowest common denominator. Right. So here, what is an Ola? Now listen to this, this is absolutely remarkable. What is an Ola, gentlemen? An Ola is a burnt offering. When you brought a Korban Ola to the Beis Hamikdash, you devoted the offering, the entire Korban was burnt on the altar, it went completely to HaKadosh Baruch. What goes to Klip the Hashem? A Shlamim is another type of offering. Now the Shlamim is shechted, but part of the Shlamim is consumed by the owner of the Korban. Okay, you're the difference. So one of the commentaries points out over here, this was a new movement, right? The golden calf movement. And like all movements in history, what's the sales point? What's the first sale? This is all for the good of the cause. Communism, this ism, that ism. It's for the good of the cause. It's an ola. It's a korban ola. First thing is it's an ola. It's all devoted to Hashem. The next stage, after you've gotten into it a little bit, then what happens? Then you start taking pieces for yourself. It's a shlomim. Part for Hashem, part for myself. And after that, it becomes lechol delisha shasa, to eat and drink. That's all for me. And then the last stage is ve'kubal tzachek, then it becomes corruption. Moral corruption, murder. Every movement in the history. Communism was supposed to solve, solve all the problems of all the evils of mankind, right? Communism was supposed to solve all the problems, and it did for the people who were the heads of the Communist Party, right? Where everybody, everybody had to, it was all for one and one for all, except for the Communist leaders who all had villas and they had money and they had everything else, right? Isn't that true? That's what you always find. It's a profound, profound idea. That's always like, it happens in all new movements. It all sounds great. It's all idealism. It's all an, it's all an ideal. You know, the ideal starts off and it quickly descends into all about me. It's all selfishness. That's idea number one. Okay. So then HaKadosh Baruch Hu says to Moshe Rabbeinu, number one. Number two, you'll notice that the real underlying ideal of many movements, certainly the hippies. I don't know, you guys are, you miss, I was a little kid when the hippies were big, when it was a big movement. The hippies, their, their motto was, do your own thing, man. It was, you ever hear that expression? Do your own thing, man. As long as your own thing is long hair, dirty blue jeans, 
and stealing things. That's do your own. That's do your own thing. We're going to fight the establishment. Abby Hoffman. They're all Jewish, by the way. They're all all the leaders of all the leaders are Jewish. Abby Hoffman wrote a book called Steal This Book. There was a book called Steal This Book. If you ever get your hands on it, right? Steal This Book. That was the name of the book. And he talks about how to get freebies where there are free restaurants across the country, how to steal, how to shoplift. They, the hippies, when they would steal, they, when they would shoplift, they didn't shoplift. They liberated a jar of peanut butter from the establishment, <laughs> right? They, they were freeing a brick of cheese, right? <laughs> and he's got all these, all these, what he called, and it's all, and at the end of the day, it became Woodstock and, and just, just rampant immorality. Right? That was, that's what it was all about. Eventually, it's in order for man. So when, whenever you have these movements, at the end of the day, it's to free man of the moral constraints. Okay. So HaKadosh Baruch Hu says to Moshe Rabbeinu, Go down, lech reid, tishiche samcha. Your people, have, your people have gone off. Now, take a look at Lam uh, Yud Yudzayin. So Moshe Rabbeinu goes down. Um... <coughs> And if you look at the bottom of 496, Moshe turns and goes down. The tablets that are written on both sides, bottom of 496. The luchos were made, of, were, were, were made by God. It is carved into the luchos. And the Mishnah in Pirkei Ava says, don't read this word as charus, last word on 496, because without the vowels it could also be read as cherus, which is freedom. And then the Mishnah says, no one is free, no one is free except the person who is involved in Torah study. What kind of freedom? Where is the freedom? Why, why, why are we free? What are we free from? If you, if you learn Torah, what are you free from? Exactly, exactly. Desires and uh, habits and uh, addictions, everybody's got addiction of some sort. I'm addicted to coffee. I'm addicted to caffeine. I have certain bad habits. People have bad habits that they involve in personally stealing money. They have habits of immorality. The only thing that can help you to get, we don't control it, it controls us. We are controlled. Anything that we, anything that we are in the habit of doing is controlling us. We are being controlled by you get people who are vegetarians, right? It's nice to be a vegetarian. You want to be a vegetarian as long as you're a vegetarian for the right reason. If you're a vegetarian because you think it's morally wrong to eat animals, then you're not a vegetarian. You are an apicores uh, because you're arguing with God. God says you can and should eat animals. You have to sacrifice them and so on and so forth. If you're a vegetarian because you're upset the way the meat industry treats animals, then if you think that you're not eating animals, that's okay. You know, it's not, you're not against God, you're against the meat industry. And if you think they're not eating the frozen chicken, which is already dead, is going to help uh, uh, change things in the meat industry, right? Uh, okay, then I'll take your piece. But if you're, uh, and if you're a vegetarian because you simply don't enjoy meat, you don't enjoy protein. You don't enjoy meat or chicken. Or That's okay too, as long as you don't. You're not arguing with Hashem. The arguing with Hashem is definitely not okay. So, I've met people who are vegetarians who the veg. There's nothing wrong with being a vegetarian, but it becomes almost like your goal of life is to be the vegetarian. Your purpose in life is to be a vegetarian. Life is about being a vegetarian. Right, which it isn't, by the way. You want to be a vegetarian? Go be a vegetarian. I, I, I have no problem with it. I, 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 I respect people who are vegetarians. I remember the first time I met a, a, one of my best friends when I was about nine or ten years old. So he said his cousins are his cousins were visiting from out of town. He said to me, "They're vegetarians." I said, "What's a vegetarian?" He said, "They don't. They, they only. They don't eat meat." And I thought, like a vegetarian is like it's almost like something you are. You know, you like you could be an Italian, or you could be you could be an Irishman, or you could be a vegetarian. I thought you're born. I thought it's a thing. I, you know, I didn't realize you know you're vegetarian till the till you meet every teenage girl who is at some point or other a vegetarian. Oh, I'm a vegetarian now. Every every teenage girl goes through that stage of being a vegetarian. So I'm also a vegetarian. I eat no vegetables at all. Right? I only eat protein. Right? So, so the, the 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 what? At least I slaughter it first. So here here the I wait I wait for it to die sometimes. So here, uh, uh, what do you call it? The only way to get free is by a person learning Torah. I'm not controlled by it. 
I don't let it control me. I control it. It doesn't control me. I don't know if I ever told you a story about this guy. Beautiful story. A guy decides he wants to rob a bank. It's a good part now, so. And, uh, and what do you call it? You know, uh, so he decides he wants to rob a bank. Now, to rob a bank, you can't just go in and rob a bank. You're going to need, you always got to get out. You always have to have some sort of scheme. So this guy puts on a police uniform. And he figures if he puts on a police uniform, nobody's going to stop. He walks into the bank with the police uniform, walks right up to the teller. Hi, good morning. How are you, officer? Great. Pulls out a gun. He says, okay, start filling a bag with money. So she starts filling the bag with money. There's a guy behind him wearing a T-shirt and dirty blue jeans. Guy pulls out a gun and he sticks it in the bed in his back. He says, I'm an undercover policeman. You're under arrest. And nope, caught in the act. So he pulls out a handcuffs and he cuffs the cop. This guy with the police, he cuffs it to himself. He starts leading him off to the police station. So they're walking down the street. <clears throat> and all of a sudden he sees his next door neighbor the guy, the undercover cop, his next door neighbor comes walking. Now, the next door neighbor, he was never able to tell him he's an undercover cop. He only knew that he does something. He's involved in something secretive, but he doesn't know what it is. So the next door neighbor comes walking, and there he is. His neighbor is handcuffed to a policeman. So he says, like, morning, Bill. Uh, mor morning, Ralph. He goes, he realized, he goes, no, no, Bill, Bill, this isn't, this isn't what you think it is. I'm not, I'm not being arrested. Oh. You see, I've never been able to tell I'm actually an undercover cop. And, and this guy was robbing a bank, and I've arrested him. So the police, the guy, the, the, the real robber, the guy in the police uniform, listen, he knows he's in trouble. He's not going to make this guy's life easier. He says, he looks at the neighbor, he says, you don't really believe that nonsense, do you? I mean, look at him and look at me. He says, Bill, I'm telling you, I'm an undercover cop. The cop is saying, this guy, look at this guy. I caught him. I'm pulling him off to the clink. So he doesn't know what to do. So finally, finally, Ralph says to Bill, there's only one way to prove this to you. The guy who's got the key to the handcuffs must be the real cop. Pull out the handcuffs, buddy. Pull out the key. The cop the cop's looking at him and says, he reaches into his own pocket and says, here to hit. I'm the one in control here. So Michael Galinsky says, we are handcuffed to the Eight Sahara. Right? He's with us everywhere we go. He gets up at Nate's. Right? <laughs> He's up way before we are. Right? Who's in control? Who's pulling who? He's pulling us or we're pulling him. That's the goal of life. Says, the guy who's learning Torah, he's the guy who's in control, number one. Then Yoshua says to Moshe the following Vayishma Yoshua es kol umbereo. Yoshua hears the sound of the people shouting. You know, people are whooping it up. There's a party going on. Vayomer al Moshe kol milchama b'machene. I hear the sounds of war. Vayomer, ain kol anos gevura, ve ain kol anos chalusha. Moshe Rabbeinu says, that is not the sound of the victors. You know, when guys win. Yahoo! You know, you got the victors, you got the guys who are defeated, and they're also yelling in defeat. Moshe says, that's not the victors, and that's not the weak people, that's not the losers. Kol anos anochi shomea. It's simply a sound of yelling. What Moshe Rabbeinu is saying to Yeshua is, there's much more going on in this conversation. Yoshua says, hey, I, I hear the sound of battle. It's not the sound of battle. It's not the sound of the victors. It's not the sound of the defeated. It's just the sound of wild yelling. It's, it's, it's unbridled lack of control. What's Moshe Rabbeinu really saying to Yoshua? It's fascinating. He says to Yoshua, listen, you're going to be taking over the leadership of these people. One day you're going to be the leader. You've got to hear the noise that the people make. You guys will see as parents, as parents when kids are playing, you can hear the sound of the kids. There's a certain sound the kids are having fun. There's a certain sound that they're getting wild. And there's a certain sound of even naughtiness. You know, like, uh, my wife used to say sometimes you know, a bunch of kids are playing in the back room and there's a certain laugh and a certain giggle. Right? Uh-oh, they're getting wild. There's a certain wildness. Then there's a certain sound they hear, uh-oh, somebody's pants are down. You know, that's a certain laugh. Somebody's pants just came down. You better get, get in there and let's put a stop to whatever's happening. And you could tell as a parent that you, but you could hear, you could hear the ring. Most of is saying to Yoshua, hey, you're going to be the leader of the people. You got to hear the sound of the people. What that really means is you got to pick up the mood over here. You got to pick up the mood. When you're a leader of a community, a rabbi of a shul, it's not f the physical sound next. What's, what, what issue, what should we make an issue out of over here? We're in Ur Samech. You know what, I think you guys have to really start uh, uh, waiting 
72 minutes on Motzei Shabbos instead of the regular time. You know, is that really the issue here? Is that really, is that something Or Sameach God should be working on, on keeping Rabbeinu Tam on Motzei Shabbos? Is that what you should be working on? Or, or maybe you should, uh, uh, there's a chumrah from the Chazon Ish on how to build a sukkah. Is that really the, the sound that's coming from the people over here? You have to be in tune as the leader. What's the need and where are the people around you holding? What is the, what is the issue right now? What can you make an issue over? Not only what is the issue, what can you even make an issue? What are you going to get shot down right away? There are a lot of things, that, you know, the, the Chazal say it's the same way it's a mitzvah to say that which will be listened to. It's a mitzvah to not say that which will not be listened to. It's a mitzvah to not say something which is going to anyway be rejected. So why say it? Why say it? And as a leader, you have to know, what are your, what are your congregants ready for? What, is, what, what are they ready to do? What are, where are they holding in life? And you have to know that about your children, you have to know that about your neighbors, you have to know that about everybody around you. So Moshe Rabbeinu is saying, that's not the sound, Yeshua. That's not the sound of, 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 of people who are fighting. That's the sound of people who are out of control. And as a leader, you have to know when to step in. Because you're going to be, you, Yoshua, you're going to be the leader. You have to know when to step in. Okay. And then Apostle Chesed says, there's another idea here. The commentaries say, <clears throat> why is it that every club you walk into, any club or bar or anything you walk into, why is it that there's always kind of a loud beat in the background? <laughs> right? And it's a beat. First thing is a, a beat, before you even get to the drugs. Right? There's a, the first thing is the beat. You're a beat. Then the drugs. Then the philosophy. Right? Yeah. Well, well, why, why is that? Why is that? Because when you want to misbehave, the first thing you have to do is you have to somehow neutralize all rational thought. How do you neutralize rational thought? <clears throat> that beat. The society around us does the exact same thing, by the way. The whole society is all about noise. Yeah, and get a get one of these and a bigger one of these and a better one of these. I'm gonna go through the airports and I'm seeing all these advertisements. You know, all the noise. There's a tremendous amount of noise in the society. Noise. They make everybody's making noise. Nobody stops to think where are we going with all this? What is the point of all this? Wow, yeah, and then you could this and oh and in the motorcycle and the car. And where are you going with it? It's all noise. It's all to distract any sort of block out any sort of rational thought. What do they do with the eagle? What do they do with the eagle? Imagine people who, guy wants to give him a balchuva. What happens for people who are looking to become from in Yiddishkeit? You sit down with a rabbi and you talk. There's no boom, 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 boom. <laughs> you know, unless you're in his house and his kids are there. Right? So, that, so that's certainly going to be what he calls. So you're going to hear some background noise. Right? You know, boom, boom, boom. What, why is that? Because when you're going to get involved in, 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 in mischief, so you better have something to block out the natural, the, 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 when you, have, you have to have something to block out rational thought. There's a Mishnah in Pirkei Ovis that says, Tzchok v'kalus rosh margilin la'erva. Laughter and literally lightheadedness, meaning lack of seriousness, leads to immorality. Why is it that immorality is always preceded by a couple of people laughing, joking, laughing, getting silly, which leads to immorality? The answer is because yet immorality is the only Avera that requires two people to consent. Murder also requires two people, but generally one of them isn't consenting. Right? He's not, he's a, generally, generally the guy who's killed isn't been asked. Right? But immorality requires two people, and we're talking about from people now, we're not talking about, I'm talking about two people who know the severity of immorality. Severity of immorality can be a capital offense. So how could two from Torah observant people Get involved in such a severe avera. There's only one way. You've got to black out rational, rational thought. How do you black out, black out rational thought? If everybody's in a silly mood and everybody's laughing and anything serious has been set aside, then two people can get involved in that sort of mischief. But that's only going to happen if you block out rational thought. What do they do at the Egel? Noise, right? First thing, the first step, the first thing they do is they start partying. They start making noise. Where's the... Uh, Oh, no, no, here it is, right over here. Vayishma is called, Yomer al-Moshe, kol milchama b'machana. 
Where, where did it say Vayivin Ego Micholos? Where? Where? Says Vayis. Oh. The Kol Ha'am. Oh, there it is. I'm supposed to get a test. Vayikas or Karav Moshe Rabbeinu saw the he saw the calf and the dances. Vayicharaf Moshe Vichnach Biyad Rav Vayshabro Sabtachas Moshe breaks the luchos. Moshe breaks the luchos because the people have gone past; they've crossed the line. So Moshe Rabbeinu breaks the luchos. By the way, the Medrash says, had Moshe Rabbeinu not broken the luchos, we would have learned Torah, and everything we learned, we would have remembered it. Just keep mowing it down like an encyclopedia. We would have learned, and we've been here. just learn and consume, just learn and learn and learn. Once Moshe Rabbeinu broke the luchos, there was a decree that Torah has to be learned with difficulty, and it's difficult to figure it out, and it's difficult to remember, and it's difficult to, what do you call it? you got to immerse yourself in it. Why is that? Because the other way, you'd learn and you'd be finished. Yeah, 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 basically know it all. You know what it's all about. Here, there's a decree that a person has to learn Torah, and you got to review it, and you could forget it. The Gemara says, the Gemara says the Torah is as difficult to acquire as gold, and it's as easy to lose as glass. Isn't it amazing? You can learn a piece of Gabar, you don't even remember where you are the next day. Right. Go tell me, tell me what we learned three pages ago in, 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 in Baba Kama. Right? We are learning Baba Kama, right? <laughs> That's how easy it is to forget. Okay. <clears throat> now, uh, take a look. That's, that, that, that's all I want to say about the, the ego. But just realize that this noise is a very, very, it's a very big, what do you call it? That's a very big, uh, a very big, uh, uh, a very, a very truth that the society makes all sorts of noise about all sorts. I show a guy was in a car in Chicago. Guy's parking a car, and he says to me, "Watch this." He pulls up parallel to the other car, hits a button on his car. He's got the, that, 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 that screen, and then the car kind of parks itself. He takes his hands off the steering wheel, and the car backs in and it parks itself. Right? You know what I'm talking about? The car you could actually program the car. In the car, when he takes his hand out of the car, it measures it. You know, they got that screen where you got that, it shows you that, that like that x ray. And then the car just kind of, the car parks itself. It's obviously designed by a man. And so the car, the car parks itself. So the, uh, the, uh, the, the, what do you, I told you, I told you, Israel, sorry, David's laughing. I told you, in Israel, they had, they, you know, they have women pilots. They have women pilots. That many airlines have women pilots, yeah. You know, hello, this is your captain speaking. My name is Shirley. Would you give me my mirror back? My name is Shirley. I, yeah. uh, we'll be flying at, <laughs> we'll be, we'll be flying at, at 37,000 feet. <laughs> right? <laughs> you, know, I, you, know, you don't want to hear that. Okay, whatever it is, they have them. So Israel, there was big news a couple of years ago because Israel has their female pilots with LL also. And apparently they had first time, there, there were two female pilots flying a plane, flying an LL flight. They flew from Israel to Cyprus. I guess, you know, we, we only trust them so far, you know, which is about a half hour, of a half hour of flight. And then I said to somebody, they, yeah, they could fly the plane and land the plane, but they probably got to get one of the men to come help park it. But the, the, the what do you call it? The, uh, sorry, I'm, I'm jet lagged. So the, uh, <laughs> the, uh, the, uh, it's just a joke, just a joke. The, um, at least the airline meals are probably better because you got someone to cook them. <laughs> so, so, uh, so it, 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 the guy was so happy to show me about this car that parks, which I was also, it's pretty neat. It's, it's pretty neat, this car that parks itself. Like, you know, we got along without it. We were okay without it up until this point. You know, it, it's like, wow, look at this. It's so neat. Like, the, like it's a cat's meow. I, mean, I was impressed, you know. I thought also, wow, it is pretty neat. But they've, we're convinced that now you got to have it. We're convinced by the noise that's made by all these things that you have to have it. I remember growing up, when I was growing up, there were dandruff, there were shampoos for dandruff commercials. Right? Yeah. Huh. He's got dandruff. You know, we, you, know you see the, the girl sees the guy and she likes that, but he's got dandruff or she's got dandruff. I didn't even know what dandruff was. And now I'm convinced 
that there are two diseases. There's cancer and there's dandruff, right? <laughs> it's one of the worst diseases known to man, right? You know, you know I'm, sure that, I'm sure that in, you know, in the 1700s, people had dandruff too, but they had other issues, like being chased through the forest by Cossacks, you know? Uh, it was like, oh no, oh, they, they, and dandruff too? <laughs> you, know, you know, the, guy, the guy's got slash in their legs, you know, oh, oh, and that, and that, you know, where, why, why, why? What's the, what's the word? Because we've been told. There are a lot of noises been made. I just got to think about it. There are a lot of things are like that. A lot of things are like that. It's the noise of the society. Okay, now I will share with you uh, one of the most powerful ideas that, that I've ever seen in Torah. And it's a very sobering thought. So, years ago, the Torah says like this. It's a Perak Lamed Gimel Pasuk Yud Aleph. 3311. In the art scroll, it's on page uh, the bottom of 502. It says, God spoke to Moshe face to face. The man speaks to his friend, and he returned to the camp. So God speaks to Moshe face to face. So years ago, a firm woman asked me, it was my wife, I mean, she's from, and uh, she said to me, wouldn't it be nice on Yom Kippur if at the end of Yom Kippur you could go up to the Aram Kodesh and open it up and get a report card? See how you're doing at the end of all, at the end of all this work. How are we really doing? Get like your Ruchni report card. And my wife is also a little bit, uh, you know, peculiar. So, uh, likes a tract. So, uh, so wouldn't it be nice if we get a report? Hey, you pick out this report. How am I doing? Okay, you got a B in davening. You got an A minus in learning. You got a C in stucca. You know, you get, you, get a, you get a report card to see at the end of the day. Huh? What needs improvement over here? You got a, a B plus in Lush and Hara, that sort of thing. <laughs> <laughs> and, and when I was a freshman in French class, in French class, the guy was reading off our grades at the end of the quarter. And he goes through every guy. He says, Mr. Cohen, you're getting an A. You know, Mr. Goldberg, you're getting a, a, a B. Yeah, he gets to me, he says, Mr. Kaplan, you're getting a very solid B plus. So I said, can I get a, can I get a wobbly A minus? <laughs> I have a friend who to this day remembers that. <laughs> he wouldn't do it. <laughs> so, so the Orachayim HaKadosh says, the Orachayim HaKadosh says, and it's in Perak Lamed Gevel Pazit, and I'm going to read you the words of the Orachayim. What does it mean that Hashem spoke to Moshe Rabbeinu, Ponim El Ponim? HaKavona Bezeh, the intent to the degree that Moshe Rabbeinu prepared himself to meet and greet the Divine Presence, to the degree that Moshe Rabbeinu prepared himself is to the degree that he actually accessed Hashem's Presence. Because to the degree that one prepares himself to access Kedusha, that's the degree that a person will achieve. The Amru, and it says, as a person speaks to his fellow. God spoke to Moshe face to face as a man speaks to his fellow, to his friend. And what does that mean? And he quotes the Pasuk in Mishli. In Proverbs, which says, As water reflects a face, so two hearts reflect each other. Now, I've mentioned this concept in the past. When you look at the water, in the old days they didn't have mirrors. You wanted to see what you look like, you look in the water. And the water reflects the face. When there's a person, if you feel that there's some friction between you and somebody else in the room or somebody else on the campus or somebody else in your family, then I can guarantee you they feel the same way towards you. If you feel there's somebody in a neighbor, you feel that there's a guy in shul who kind of, he gives you, he kind of, he's cold towards you. I guarantee you he feels you're cold towards him. 
It's the way it works. Hearts can sense a heart. In the extreme, when you're married, you can basically sense, you can sense your spouse's mood. After a while, if you're married long enough, you can sense the mood. Not only that, it can be so extreme, you can open, I can open the front, you can open the front door and walk into the house, and you already sense that you're in trouble. <laughs> and even if I'm not in trouble, somebody's somebody made trouble. Somebody, she's not in a good mood. I could tell. I could tell her mood. I could tell the, the mood is not get up by opening the front door. Hearts sense each other. It's a remarkable thing. And what's really remarkable is how often I'm thinking about something and my wife brings it up right on the spot before I even say anything, right? And, and you know, which, which, which is, which, and it works both ways. So he says, a heart can say, that's what the Pasuk is saying. Moshe says, Vaidabra Shema Moshe Ponim El Ponim. And the Pasuk initially says, Kemaim Haponim Laponim. As water reflects a face. Now listen carefully. Says the Orachayim. And here's the kicker. He says, the same way that hearts could sense each other, he says, Kimochain Diber Hashem Ponim El Ponim. Umeata, and now based on this, Yavchin Odom Mahu Im Kodo. You can now check where you're holding with God. Didn't you ever ask yourself, I wonder if Hashem likes me? Did you ever wonder about what does Hashem think of me really? You know, I'm good. I put out fill and I gave stuck. I, I helped an old lady. What does Hashem think of me? Does Hashem like me or he doesn't like me? Even though, before I continue, even though we know that all emotion is obviously only our way of relating to Hashem, Hashem has no emotions whatsoever. Hashem is never stuck in traffic, right? So Hashem never gets in a bad mood. There are no moods by Hashem. But even when we say God was angry at the Jewish people, that's only that what's happening is what we would describe a human being as being anger. God does not have any emotion. God doesn't have good days and bad days. The Rebona Shalom, when we say God is kind, God is kind to the, his kindness. It doesn't mean that he one day he, the market was up, so God was in a better mood. It means that Hakadosh Baruch Hu is steady and unchanging. It's beyond our comprehension. But when something happens down here, so we describe it as either the Mida of Chesed or the Mida of Din, or God is angry, or God is kind, or God is merciful, based on how a human being would describe those circumstances. So, does Hashem like us? Says your Chaim. Here's how you could the acid test. Im levavo yisavaviachshok ba Hashem. If your heart desires and craves a relationship with God, vuavodoso and to serve Him, vineze hineze simen kashem ahevo. That's a sign Hashem likes you. Keith, water reflects the face. Kemaim upon Him, upon Him. If you're excited about putting on tefillin and you're eager to help other people, and you find it repulsive to speak Lashon Hara, so that means that Akash Baruch is pleased with you. If you're pleased to do Hashem's Avodah, Hashem pleases you. If everything is a drag, okay, you're a drag too. <laughs> right? that's, that's the way it works. If we're, if we're mm, boy, what, I gotta, I gotta go learn? Oh, I gotta give ches, oh yeah, I gotta pay tuition, oh yeah, I gotta, oh yeah, I gotta, oh yeah, I gotta, okay, it's better not doing it. But that's where the relationship is. I don't know the parameters here. I don't know exact parameters here. And it could be that in different areas the relationship is different. I'm good at I'm good at davening. I may not be good at tzedakah. I'm good at tzedakah. I may not be good at learning. I'm not enthusiastic about learning. It could be there are different aspects of the relationship. I assume it is. But if a person wants to know, what does that Kodesh Baruch think of me? What do you think of him? What do you think of this person? What is this person? I wonder, I wonder if this guy likes me. Well, I like him, so I'm sure he likes me. That's the way it is. If I like this guy, I'm sure this guy likes me. That's the way it is with people. That's the way it is with people. And therefore, the Torah is saying, if you want to gauge where you're holding with the Rebona Shalom, uh, how enthusiastic are you about Torah and, Torah and mitzvahs? How enthusiastic are you about it? And enthusiastic, I don't mean that you're, that you're jumping around and making noise and saying Asher Yatsar loudly and annoying everybody around you. I don't mean that. <laughs> enthusiastic, enthusiasm is in the heart. I don't mean that you're, I don't mean that you're a traveling salesman for Judaism. Right? And a gum snapper who's selling Judaism. We don't, need gun, we don't need Jewish salesmen and gun snappers. But if a person's really, you know, you're into it. I'm really into it. Okay, that means God's into it also. That's what the Orachim is saying. It's a remarkable, remarkable Orachim. Just remarkable. Okay. The, uh, uh, the end of the Parsha, 
One more thought over here. Yorachayim, by the way, mercifully, he says, if you're excited about it, God's excited about you. And mercifully, he doesn't say the other, he doesn't say the flip side. And Yorachayim just kind of leaves it on the, he leaves it on an up. Okay. Take a look right at the end of the, uh, right at the end of the Parsha. I want to finish this today because tomorrow we're going to go on to Vayakil. Um... Perik Lamed Dalet. So, Perik Lamed Dalet, Moshe Rabbeinu comes down from the, mount, from the mountain. It actually starts on Pazuk Chavtes. Moshe Rabbeinu is up there for 40 days and 40 nights. He didn't eat and he didn't drink. And then in page... Uh, oh, why am I... I don't need this now. If it's on page... Five? Fourteen. Moshe Mehar Sinai. Moshe comes down from the mountain. He had the two tabs of Moshe. Lo yoda ki koron or pona bedabri. The Moshe now that his face was glowing. Moshe's face was glowing. So the major says, where did Moshe get the glow from his face? Where did he get that glow? The major says. God wiped the ink that was left in the parchment. He wiped it on Moshe Rabbeinu. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Ink left in the parchment, huh? When it comes to what God didn't know how much ink he's going to need. Right? And Moshe Rabbeinu has a glow. Why is there ink left in the parchment? It left it, it was like, why is there ink left in the quill? Not the parchment, the quill. He wiped the quill off on Moshe Rabbeinu. Why should there be ink left in there? Implication is that something was going to be written, but it wasn't written. What wasn't written? What wasn't written? The Moshe Rabbeinu's name. Moshe Rabbeinu said to God, erase me. Oh, you're willing to go to bat for the Jewish people. That's the, that's the depth of the Medrash. There was no real quill, gentlemen. There was no quill that he wiped off on Moshe Rabbeinu's head. The Medrash says it. The Medrash is telling you that it was Moshe Rabbeinu's merit of going to bat for the Jewish people that brings him the glow on his face over here. He's got Kirun Orpanov. This is what, what's his name, Michelangelo? That's where he got the idea that Jews have horns. And the famous, famous painting of Michelangelo, the, the, what, the, what's it called, the Sistine Chapel? The Sistine Chapel, where he painted with Moses with the horns. It's like there are Jews in history who have been asked by, you know, hey, you're Jewish, is that thing on your head to cover the horns? Right? The, the people, plenty of Jews have been asked that. They couldn't, they wouldn't, they couldn't, they were afraid to approach Moshe Rabbeinu. So Moshe Rabbeinu wore a mask. And he took it off and he put it on. So I heard from the Novominsker Rebbe, he once said, that it's not just Moshe Rabbeinu. Every single one of you has a Kirin or Panam. Every single one has a glow. You have a glow. A Torah Jew, a Jew's connected to Torah, has a glow. Don't go running to the mirror, you won't see it. Right? But other people see it on us. People see. Maybe you'll see you're different. You, you, other people could sense. There's a sense that this is a person who's living life differently. Some people have even more of a glow. Rabbi Chaim Kinevsky has a tangible glow when you go in to see him. There are, you know, certain, certain people, the Satmar of Rabbi Yol from Satmar had, had a Rabbi Moshe Feinstein. It was, it was, you'd have to be blind not to see it, not to sense it. But every Jew has a Kiran or Panim. Every Jew has, has the Kiran or Panim. That's a result of a person living a life of self-control. So it's a life. It's written on a person's face. And so I told you, the word Panim, which means face, is one of the most ironic words in Lashon HaKodesh. What does the word Panim mean? Internal. Internal. Your face is the most external part of you. Why would this be called? This shouldn't be called my panim. This should be called my chutz. Right? This is the chutz. Why is this my panim? Why is your face your panim? Because her face reflects what's going on inside. You see a person, you can tell a person who, you know, you don't have to be, you don't have to be that brilliant to take a look at some people. I told you there are certain people that you meet, and your first thought is, no matter what happens, I will never lend this person money. <laughs> <laughs> not, not, with a, not with a with a guarantee and not with a lien and not with a, what's it called, an, ap, an apotiki, nothing. I'm not lending him money. I don't trust this guy. 
The other people you look at, this person is a person of, of substance. The person is just a nice person. He's just a nice person. You don't have to be a genius to see it. That's what, that's what the Kirin or Panim is. Kirin or Panim means it's not just Moshe Rabbeinu. Moshe Rabbeinu had it to the extent that he needed to wear a mask. What is it? It means there's, no, there's almost nothing physical. It's after 40 days and 40 nights. The devoid of physicality. A life of self-control. But there's a life of self-control. So, so then the, 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 it, it frees the Ruchni part of the person. has nothing blocking it anymore. There's no physical essence to the person. There is no physical essence to the person. Some people have no essence at all. I once saw a picture of the stones, the rolling stones. They're 70 years old. Mick Jagger and those guys, 70 years old. They look like they died and somebody, somebody sucked their souls out of them. They look like walking skeletons. Nothing spiritual about them. It was, like, it was like almost a frightening look. Right? You see Gedola Yisrael who have so little physical to them. And there's just, there's just it's, all, it's all Ruchni. It's, it's pure spirituality. Pure, so, so to the degree that we make ourselves Ruchni people is the degree that people sense it. All right, see you tomorrow.